these things have been known to explode. Yeah. But they've usually exploded when people are really pushing them to yeah. conditions where they probably shouldn't go. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Cosmic Cast. You're here with me, the refreshing morning breeze that is Rick Bibber here. We also have uh, the warm summer's mist, Marissa Lowe. Hi. And uh, the cold, clammy hand that is Dr. <laughs> John Pernet Fisher. Hello there. <laughs> and today we have a guest for you all. <laughs> the morning cup of Joe, Dr. David Neve. Hi. Hello. Great to be here. Good. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Yes. Um, so, you're, would it be fair to say you're an experimental petrologist? Uh, yeah, definitely. So, that wasn't where I thought I'd start out, but that sort of seems to be where I've ended up. But... Um, yeah, I like to try and keep my hand in some geochemistry, some volcanology as well. But I guess, yeah, experimental petrology is my and, main thing these days. And what got you to this point then? Where did you do your PhD and what was that in? Um, so I did my PhD in Cambridge in igneous petrology. So understanding really how magma chambers work. And that was just looking at natural rocks. Mm. So I did my, did my research looking at material from Iceland. Mm measuring crystals and melt inclusions pockets of liquid inside these crystals to try mm. and understand how magma chambers work. Um, and I well, yeah, was interested in where magma chambers are, how they work, um, what happens before eruptions. Mm. Um, but then when I got towards the end of my PhD, I kind of realized our ability to understand these, these processes was kind of limited. Mm. So we needed more, more information, more experiments, more, more experiments under controlled conditions to try and understand these natural materials. So yeah, that's what took me in an experimental direction. And so did you go from straight from your PhD to your position here at Manchester? Or? No, no. So I, um, yeah, I finished up my PhD, was thinking around postdocs, um, what I could do, where I could do it. I was kind of interested in seeing some different new places. So I um, applied for a Humboldt Foundation postdoc, which mm. is a great scheme run by the German government for um, non-German nationals to go to Germany for a year or two. And I applied for one of those and went to Hanover in northern Germany, to, which is a real powerhouse of experimental petrology mm. to, to learn the skills, basically, to try and address these new questions. So yeah, I was there for a couple of years on the Humboldt, then wrote another project, stayed for a few more years, and then mm. along came this opportunity to, to move to Manchester. And so you're now, it's basically kind of like a tenure track position you have, I guess, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like a, a tenure track lectureship, um, mostly focusing on research to begin with, but then easing into yeah. more roles as, as time goes on. Mm. So yeah, hopefully picking up a lectureship in, in a couple of years' time, yeah. yeah. So how have you found that transition from pure post through to, I guess, something a bit more permanent? Um, it's a big relief, actually. Yeah. I've found you spend a lot of your time as a postdoc writing applications. Mm. And a lot of these applications are rejected. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the, the one that came along in Manchester was, you know, application seven or eight mm. or so. Now, each time you write an application, they get a bit better. You think, you know, you can use these rejections to think harder about what you want to do and why. Mm -hmm. So they're still a useful tool, but at some point it's quite useful to be able to actually do some research mm -hmm. yeah. rather than just writing yes, yeah. <laughs> about well, absolutely. wanting to do it. Yeah. So that's been a, a big relief for yeah. me. Oh, it's very stressful. Um, I mean, you know, so for the listeners out there, I'm only on fixed term contracts and again, like David, right, trying to write unsuccessfully thus far various proposals. So it is... Uh, yeah, it can be very stressful, and it can be quite demoralizing, too. Um, I mean, I don't know how you... I mean, how, how, do you have any sort of coping mechanism, or how did you find getting uh, so many rejections? Um, I think it really depends a lot on the nature of the rejection. Sometimes mm. it's just, this is good, we don't have enough money to fund everyone, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get some useful feedback, you can think, oh, how, I, how can I make this mm -hmm. better? How can I do some of this work anyway? How can I collaborate with other people, do this in a cheaper way, do it for free. Mm. Um, there are ways around that. What really is frustrating is when you just get a, 
unhelpful review and uh, sort of or, or no reviews back because mm -hmm. then you think well there goes a week and yeah. i don't know how i can do it better next time yeah yeah but yeah, yeah mixed bags <laughs> yeah i think it's an interesting insight i mean um you know i think I guess a lot of people perhaps don't realize how difficult it is actually to pick up more permanent positions and that how highly competitive each advertised position can be. It's not quite like the 70s and 80s where you would just walk into a lectureship off the back of your PhD, mm. actually. So. so as a first year PhD student, I obviously haven't gone through this process before. Mm. Um, what is the general path to, say, a permanent position nowadays? Well, this is a difficult question. Yeah, I'm though. sure it varies from person to yeah. person, but what, what's the general path? Well, I mean, I would say that in an ideal world, you would do, you know, one, maybe two postdocs and then try and find something permanent, either through writing your own project or just mm. getting a straight up lectureship. Mm. But, you know, I mean, a lot of my friends who are, who are in a similar position have done many years of postdocing. I mean, I've gone through quite a few years now myself and it kind of progressively becomes more difficult at a point as well. If you postdoc too many times, you get to a stage where I, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I don't know this, but what I've heard, um, where people start to become slightly more reluctant to employ you because they know you're looking for something more permanent. So they're unlikely to employ you if you're on your, say, sixth postdoc because they know you're only going to come there possibly for a year before you're actually going to move somewhere else to do a permanent position. Uh, but essentially, yeah, as John said, the, I guess the aim is you do a few postdocs and then you apply somewhere for a permanent position. Although uh, having said that, I do know friends who've gone straight from their PhD to um, into a lectureship position. But in, in like, particularly in America, they've gone straight into teaching, straight in, and with very little time to do research. And actually, I think that having that little bit of time to just, just focus on research, build up some publications, experience some new cities and stuff has been quite a valuable experience, I think. Yeah, it can be quite disruptive, but there are two ways you can view it. One is, oh, all of these horrible hurdles you have to jump through to eventually get a permanent job. Or you can see the opportunities. You know, I, I went to Germany because there was a great scheme where I could get my own research independence very early. That was something I think that was very important and good fun. And then also, yeah, I, I have always wanted to live abroad. That was an opportunity to do, the, do that. Move to a new country, move to a new city, learn a new language. So, you know, advantages and disadvantages, but you can frame the question in different ways. I yeah, think. for sure. I definitely saw it as a very exciting opportunity to go and uh, live and work anywhere. Mm. I remember thinking after my PhD, well, this is great. I can literally go and work anywhere in the world, <laughs> which is quite an exciting thing, actually. So how did you enjoy living in Germany? Yeah, no, that was a great experience, actually. Um, Germany's a lot more different from the UK than I initially expected, but um, Hanover was a very welcoming city. I was in a very friendly institute in the university, um, which had very different specialisms from what I experienced during my PhD in Cambridge. So it was really a good opportunity to learn something completely new. Um, yeah, the research landscape in Germany is quite different, it seems, from in the UK. Um, research funding seems to be a lot more abundant mm. <laughs> but permanent weird. contracts are much harder to come by okay. so it means you know you have institutes with very few permanent staff um, really sort of kept afloat by the by the PhD body yeah but there's more money available to do that so again advantages and disadvantages yeah. um, but I felt very very welcome there and um, it was a great opportunity to move to Manchester, something with a bit more sort of permanent oh, yeah. uh, prospects and the opportunity to maybe build something on the sort of five, ten year time scale. But I was quite sad to leave. Mm. But I'm still working very closely with people in Germany, yeah. involved in projects, writing new projects together, lots of collaborations. And yeah. actually, well, I'll be off yeah. to visit them again next month. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Great. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I guess that's a good reason, isn't it, to a postdoc is to start to build some of those collaborations and long term relationships. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important part of it is you can then yeah start to build a wider network. You know, you can't be an expert in every tool, everything you might want to ever study or every method you might want to use so working in different places yeah helps build up this network and it's a very international community and the majority of people wherever they are usually seem pretty helpful you know they want to help they want to do good yeah. stuff despite whatever reviewer two says anyway well, yeah there's always a reviewer two out there somewhere <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> Where are they? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> So, uh, David, before you actually started your position here, I think I remember you saying to me um, that when you got the position, you didn't know that it was actually a tenure track position until after you actually got the position. Yeah. So I I, I, um, I saw this sort of four-year fellowship advertised mm. and I saw that it had some... The, the wording was uh, interesting, but it what didn't strike me immediately that it was effectively a lectureship. Mm. And then I went to my interview, had my yeah. interview, and then came came to the school here and had a had a chat with the head of school and mm. only then did i realize oh <laughs> it's better than i even thought <laughs> <That is>. so, <laughs> well may, maybe that helped maybe i was a bit more relaxed in the interview then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> made, it a bit, made it a bit easier going yeah. um maybe that helped out a bit but yeah no very happy that that yeah that was in uh, fact better than i expected i mean i think it's quite nice that they sort of ease you into it so to speak instead of just um dropping like loads of different teaching modules on top of you and all mm. that kind of stuff it's a yeah it doesn't yeah so i i guess i'm a romantic i still have a very idealistic view of what a university mm -hmm. should be you know um i enjoy research very much i also enjoy teaching a lot mm. and having contact with students mm. uh, and seeing them sort of learn and grow um but there's a big like administrative hurdle to cross when you or sort of jump over when 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 doing a lot of teaching and i mm. think when you start in a new job you've got to learn how all the systems work you've got to learn the course when you have to digest all of that to be able to do that and do research mm -hmm. and write proposals and write papers is really hard so i think i definitely want to be a lecturer i want to be a teacher mm -hmm. but i also quite glad that i can hopefully ease into that a bit yeah definitely yeah um, must, must be a, a huge help so are fellowships designed to be that sort of step between the postdocs and becoming a lecturer uh yeah yeah so i guess the key thing as about being a fellow say as opposed to a postdoc is that you would have your own project you're mm -hmm. doing your own okay. research independently of of somebody else so I think that's that's the idea to help you build your independence and to be able to demonstrate that you can do that. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So that's that's yeah that's the key point of a fellowship as opposed to a postdoc. Though many people within postdocs also have a lot of freedom to pr pursue their own ideas, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are supportive of that too. So at the moment, your role isn't just that you are you've come here and you're going to start doing your research. You're actually setting up a, a lab, is that right? You have your own lab you're trying to basically put together. Uh, yeah. So um, so I do experiments um, at high pressures and high temperatures. Mm. So what do I mean by that? So high temperatures, maybe one thousand to one thousand two hundred degrees. Mm -hmm. Temperatures of magma chambers. Pressures pressures of um, a few thousand bars. Okay. Um, so that's hundreds of megapascals, and these are the pressures and temperatures in in the in the crust, in in magma reservoirs. Mm. So um, I was using a piece of equipment called an internally heated pressure vessel in Hanover to do these experiments. Mm. Um, and at the moment in the UK, there isn't really a, a lab up and running using these. In okay. Edinburgh, they do some experiments in, in this kind of direction, but there's no one really kind of looking at magmatic processes. Mm. So I'm really keen to develop that here in Manchester, which which was a big specialism for Manchester back in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, I'm kind of keen to, to re rekindle that. Mm. And actually, there's, um, there's some kit in the department that's been very... Uh, uh, graciously received from another university second hand that will give us a, a bit of a leg up to doing so oh, so i'm in the process nice. of trying to trying to gather support and funds from the university mm. to get this set up but things are looking promising yeah. so far yeah yeah I and mean, they're very cool type experiments so you're, you're basically correct me if i'm wrong sort of creating your own rocks inside this vessel which is tremendously cool so how do you go about doing that yeah so it's very easy to do an experiment at surface pressure you basically heat up some powdered rock in a controlled atmosphere and then then you you produce a rock but at surface pressure if you want to mm -hmm. look at what's going on in a magma chamber you need some confining pressure mm -hmm. you know magma chambers aren't at the surface they're they're deeper in the earth so you need you need um you need some way to confine that so what you what i do is you basically powder some kind of rock that uses your starting material or you mm -hmm. mix it up from chemicals oxides and carbonate powders you pack it into a capsule with which it doesn't react so gold or platinum mm -hmm. or something like this 
and you can seal that shut so it stays a more or less a closed system. Mm. Uh, and then the kind of experiments that I do is then you put that in a, in a pressure vessel uh, and you pressurize that with gas, an inert gas like argon, okay. which doesn't react. So you, yeah. you, you squeeze this capsule of, of material to well, 2,000 bars or something, which is mm. the equivalent of about, I don't know, six, seven kilometers of rock on top. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just with gas, just yeah. with argon gas. And then you heat this up to create the conditions in a, in a magma mm. reservoir. Then, then you try and quench this, so that's like cool it down really quickly, and then you preserve the chemistry and the textures of the minerals and the liquids or the glasses um, so you can, yeah, create your artificial rock effectively, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So how, how big are these, uh, these, these vessels? Um, they're not that big, so, you know... The, the the volume that you have that's at high pressures and high temperatures might only be about one centimeter in diameter and about two, mm-hmm. three centimeters long. So quite small. Um, the whole apparatus itself is no bigger than a, a few meters squared, a few meters cubed. Mm. So um, so they're not that big, really. The challenge is you need a big block of big, tube, heavy tube mm. of high, you know, high grade steel or other curious alloys to to keep the pressure in and that's yeah. that's the challenge but they're, they're not they're not so big i was going to say do these so the tubes withstand all that pressure then uh, yeah and so when you get this sample out of this tube yeah. what does it look like yeah so when you put it in you'd have a little basically little shiny tube of gold or platinum mm. or something with your sample inside and when you bring it out you'll just see that that's been squeezed down mm. onto the sample a bit like a sort of uh a boiled sweet or yeah. something it looks like <laughs> when it comes out uh and then you you just have to sort of cut that thing open up. or yeah, peel yeah. off the the gold and platinum and then you stick that in some resin or something you can polish it to then to then measure it on on a on various pieces mm-hmm. of kit yeah yeah and how does it take very long to do um so i think so most experiments you would only last maybe say some hours to a few days um, and this is always a problem, you know, and we worry a lot about attaining equilibrium. This mm-hmm. is a phrase that you'll hear a lot in the experimental world. You know, um, the natural experiments, the earth or wherever else run, run over long time scales, years, decades, millions of years even. So there's lots of time for the chemical species to communicate with each other and reach something close to equilibrium. You know, we obviously can't do that in a lab, you know. Um, both for practical reasons that you need some results within some reasonable length of time, but mm-hmm. also just, for example, keeping the pressure inside a pressure vessel for more than a week or so starts to get yeah. that t- problematic engineering challenge. So you try to run the experiments for as long as you can whilst still having this sort of practicality yeah. about it. Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing I do know about some of these papers is that you can have often hundreds of different experiments and they can take years i guess it's very easy to get bogged down into uh the fine details because i guess so am i right in thinking every time you're every time you're running an experiment you're perhaps tweaking a different parameter to try and look at a behavioral relationship over you know, some various yeah collection if you're, of factors yeah if you're in kind of completely new terrain you kind of have to find out where where you are in that you know mm. you if you're in, if you're looking at systems where we don't know much about the thermodynamics, you can't really do any um, any modeling beforehand to get mm. a rough idea where you might be. In other systems where people have looked in more detail, then you can you have some idea where you're heading. Mm. But yeah, it, you it it is a, it is quite a slow process. It can be quite a slow process and one that can be prone to failure. You know, things are running at high temperatures, high pressures. Things have to be sealed. You know, there's a lot of potential sources of failure here, um, so you often end up having to tinker and stuff with things. But I quite like that as well. That's there's like a m- sort of mechanical, physical. Yeah, I imagine side it's a lot more this. hands-on than some of the other aspects that we use. Mm. I guess. Yeah, yeah, sort of fiddling around, soldering bits of wire yeah. together, and fiddling with bits of ceramics to make things work. It's yeah, it can be quite satisfying, but yeah. also frustrating. Yeah. But I think that the, the, the powerfulness of what you can learn from these things are tremendous. And so to give a lunar example, I guess, a lot of how we know 
that the moon's mantle is, is made of and the crystallization sequence of things like the lunar magma ocean come from these sorts of experiments. Mm. But as you say, because this is kind of like unknown territory, it, it's taken, it takes groups like many, many years in order to fully crystallize out the moon from, from start mm. to finish. Mm -hmm. And there are not that many papers out there, but just because it takes decades in some cases of various PhD projects amalgamated yeah. to get mm. these things done. So it's, it's, it's in a way, it's, it's a good sort of fundamental science tool, I guess. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think so, because, well, so what I realized in my PhD, you can make, you know, any number of natural measurements, or measurements on natural samples, rather, and um, you might still struggle to interpret things, whereas quite often you can pose the question in a different way, and mm -hmm. even a handful of experiments would may not give you the absolutely correct answer, but they would give you an indication as to what was the case. Yeah, your example about the lunar magma ocean is like a classic example. A colleague of mine, Olivier Namur from Leuven, he was in Hanover with me for a while. He's done lots of experiments on mercury. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a, a body which some far as I'm aware of, we don't have any known material mm -hmm. from. Yep. But there's spectroscopic measurements from the messenger mission that he was able to then use to mix up starting compositions into mm -hmm. experiments to say something about what the structure and behavior of mercury might be like mm. based on experiments. You, there's no way you could do that from a natural measurement. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's still, it's it's a potentially very powerful tool. It is. And I guess also, actually, what's quite nice about it is that not only do you get the sort of top high level, pretty sexy stuff like understanding Mercurian geology, but also it's just some of the more basic things like how do elements partition into minerals and very sort of basic questions that perhaps don't necessarily get into nature, but are still so fundamental for everything else that, that we do in terms of geochemistry. Well, and there are huge aspects that are just still completely, well, not say not completely unknown, but are still very uncertain. Oh, huge gaps, yeah. Um, so, so I think Zoltan was moaning about this a few weeks ago, how <laughs> he was getting frustrated that there weren't enough of these experiments for some of the systems that he looks yeah, at. Yeah, <laughs> so he's looking at kind of alkaline rocks from the Canary Islands, and there are hardly any experimental results published on these things. Yeah, it seems amazing, really, that there are still these huge gaps in knowledge, but I guess, I mean, why is that, do you think? Is that just because it's not as easy to get funding for some of these less sexy concepts? I think so, yeah. So a lot of the time you need a big idea to get to get things funded, and then people end up chasing these big ideas. Mm. I think the most powerful way is try and work out a big idea, but make sure you collect as much basic information mm -hmm. along the way as you can like you say about things like how elements partition between different liquids and minerals and these kinds of things um yeah because most of the stuff that i've been doing recently has been looking at the evolution of basalts and you would think basalts on earth are one of the most probably the most studied igneous rock and we must understand everything but there are still big gaps in our understanding um and a lot of the time people think if there's some tool which enables us to produce some model you know, computer model of what's going on, then we must understand it. But then, of course, the computer model is only as good as the experimental data on which it was calibrated. So, yeah. So it, it there, there is a challenge, but it's um yeah try as many birds with as few stones as possible. Mm. I think that's the the key approach. Uh, so, is part of what you do is it taking these models and testing whether what they predict is actually correct uh, using the machinery itself then. Uh, yeah, so quite a lot of what I've been doing up until recently was looking at ways of estimating the depths at which magma chambers are, mm. or magma reservoirs are, where, and I did this by looking at the depths and pressures at which a type of mineral called clinoperoxine would mm. crystallize. Um, and this is basically because the higher the pressure, the more sodium mm. you put into clinoperoxine crystals. That's basically the, the premise behind this. So I used a load of experimental data to, to test models that were out there find out what their limitations were and then refine them and then hopefully produce a model which is still a model so it's imperfect mm. but it's hopefully less wrong than what was out there before yeah, yeah. so yeah so there's a bit of testing models and then a bit of developing new ones as well yeah so uh what are the main things you're hoping to use your lab for um so something that i'm sort of really interested in now is well how well, we know that the mantle is like is really compositionally heterogeneous on Earth. We know that it has regions of different composition, mm. regions of different mineralogy. Um, something I'm quite interested in looking at is, does it have regions of different redox? So we know that as you 
subduct material back into the mantle. Mm -hmm. um, at subduction zones, you bring in material with different composition and mm -hmm. material that's potentially quite oxidized. Does this yep. material then change the redox of the mantle? Can we see that? Um, and to do this, we have to look at the products of volcanoes because they provide us a way of sampling the mantle. Mm -hmm. But the tools we have at the moment to look at this are quite, you know, they don't all work in all different settings. They have quite specific characteristics. So I'm quite interested in developing new models for this. And the, and the lab would come into this because I want to do experiments at different redox conditions to then create new tools to, to investigate that. And that's that's one of the, the key aims of of this kind of setting up of a lab. So how far down the line are you in terms of, uh, have you still got to procure some of your new instruments and uh, have you got a space carved out already? Yeah, so um, there are some rooms in the basement uh, down here which are which used to be a Drosophila breeding lab, so fruit fly <laughs> breeding lab apparently <laughs> back in the day and have been empty for a few years now. <laughs> Um, so those have been sort of allocated for this for this new lab mm. opposite the rock deformation lab that's a lab which actually used very similar techniques to yeah. address very different yeah. questions about rock physics mm. and rock behavior so that's a really great synergy actually having those labs together mm. so we've got that space and the kind of the case for funding and the case for renovation is currently sitting with the faculty so yeah. fingers crossed that we'll hear something back soon and can get that get those works underway um, and then I can start thinking, if once we've got a space, then I can think about trying to put in newer equipment yeah. as well. Um, yeah, like I said, this kind of equipment like I was using in Hanover, that would be the real, the real long-term goal. What's the maximum pressure for these kind of equipment? How deep can you go? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Depends who you ask. So safety here is a big issue. Yeah. <laughs> so... These things have been known to explode, yeah, but they've usually exploded when people are really pushing them to yeah. conditions where they probably shouldn't go. So is that because so, they just try and get the pressure so high, there's so much gas in it that the machine itself can't? Yeah, exactly. And after things, of, so most of the experiments I'd want to do maybe up to say three thousand bars or so, which is equivalent to a depth of about say ten kilometers or so. Okay, yeah. You can quite safely operate up to 5,000 bars, mm. maybe, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, like 15, 16 kilometers, something like that. Yeah, that's still amazing. Really. Yeah, yeah, more pressure. People have done experiments at higher pressure, but then you get closer to the, the, to the limits of things. And what we actually, yeah. what, well, the incidents that I know of have been basically when things have been pressurized and depressurized, eventually the, 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 the steels work harden and then fail. They just yeah. crack, basically. So if you stay well within their notional limits, you know, if you only ever go to half of the maximum pressure, yeah. then you're not going to be a, yeah. not going to be having too much problem. But mm -hmm. some people in the past used to go up to yeah, 10 kilobars or so. But it's also a question of cost. You know, a valve that's safe to 10 kilobars or 10,000 bars costs three times yeah. one for 5,000 5, mm -hmm. bars. Because so, yeah. if you want to go deeper, is it these uh, diamond anvils and things like that? Is so, that what you use? So, so the kind of hierarchy is sort of you have a furnace for doing stuff at one atmosphere, so mm -hmm. the surface, then pressure vessels for, say, you know, up to, say, 5,000 bars or something like that. Mm -hmm. And above that, you use something called a piston cylinder, Okay, right. which yeah. is basically where you put your capsule in something, a deformable solid, mm -hmm. something like a salt mm -hmm. or something like that, which is solid, but... When you squeeze it, it evenly distributes the pressure. Yeah. But those only really work above about 5,000 bars. Right. Okay. Uh, but those can go up to uh, much higher pressure, so 40,000 bars or something like that. So that can take you into the upper mantle. And then mm -hmm. to go to greater depths, you use something called a multi-anvil, which I always think sounds extremely cool, <laughs> <laughs> um, which have these, basically you, you put blocks of tungsten carbide in a in a press and then you can squeeze a sample and then from there you go to a diamond anvil cell which is basically where you have two two pointy diamonds yeah, yeah, yeah. and you squeeze them together um but as you get smaller and smaller the size of the sample gets smaller yeah, and smaller, smaller so i can yeah. use something that's a you know a centimeter long and a couple mm. of millimeters in diameter but a diamond anvil mm. cell experiment yeah. is you know a fraction of a millimeter across. Yeah, yeah. and i guess that these are the guys that are doing work on like core mantle boundary stuff aren't they yeah it blew yeah. my mind when I saw someone preparing one of these experiments. So you just get two diamonds 
and you put them in a little rig made of steel and you apply the pressure with a screwdriver. <laughs> you know, so you're creating and then you heat it up with a laser to get it to the right temperature. Yeah. But the pressure you have just applied just by screwing That's some screws crazy. together. That, it seems somehow beautifully that, low that tech. Breeds, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that breeds some misconceptions in my head about how the earth works. Like, is me screwing a screwdriver as much mass and pressure as the core <laughs> and the mantle? So, yep. Between then, the tips of two diamonds, yeah. then, okay, then yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. That's very cool. Well, um, it's been amazing having you on, David. And uh, just before we, we unfortunately have to end the podcast, we, we have a final question for you. And uh, we, we ask all our guests this question just to make you make sure you know you're not special. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if you weren't involved in the, this area of research that you're currently in, is there anything scientifically or outside of science that you would would be particularly interested in? Yeah. So, so there are really two things that drew me into academia. One was the kind of sense of problem solving. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to you're trying to sort of optimize systems, trying to find answers, trying to re you know gather information to find a a better way of doing things, a new idea. Mm. And the other was for me working in an environment that feels kind of progressive, in the sense that you're doing work which hopefully, in some sense, is beneficial to society at large. Yeah. Um, creating new information, teaching new generations. So I think those are the things that are most important to me. Um, but if I were not in academia, I'm not, I'm not so sure what I do. I don't know. Certain things appeal to me. I don't know. Um, working in something like the railways or something like yeah. that, which involves like, you know, looking at complicated systems, but also doing something which is hopefully generally useful yeah, for people. Yeah. And I'd love to work in the railways. A, a, a appreciative, you know, so... Yeah, this kind of thing. It'd probably still be pub public sector of some yeah. kind. Yeah, yeah I, I think. definitely feel the same. If I wasn't doing academia, I'd definitely want to do something in the realm of public service. Yeah. yeah. Like... Well, you just want the little hat, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh... And a whistle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, David, thank you very much for yeah, coming on. Welcome. And we'll definitely have to get you on again. Yes. Particularly once your lab is uh, up and running and you're starting yep. to crank out results, we'd definitely be. Yeah, well, cool you to know get where you back I am. All <laughs> 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 right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you.